We're going to take a look this morning at a uh, small book, but uh, I, I think an important one. And so we're going to look at Jude today, which is the book before Revelation. And we're also going to look at other scripture. So um, we're going to start off by just reading the first couple of verses and then uh, exegeting those verses and giving you the opportunity to understand the foundation. Now, um, let me ask you this question, okay? Who did Christ come and who, what, who, who is, uh, what did Jesus grow up as? Jew. A Jew, right? And so the, uh, what was that? Carpenter's son. A carpenter's son, a Jew, yeah, but the, the, the background is Judaism. So you're going to see in this book a couple different things. One of the things you're going to see is that there is a comprehensive uh, look at some of the instances in the Old Testament that you may and may not be familiar with, but that's one of the reasons why I encourage you to read the Bible from Genesis straight through to Revelation. We have that reading schedule that you can use. But well, let's take a quick look at this. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. Now, James is a church leader at this point. He's very well known. We see him kind of mediating the uh, Council of Jerusalem. He has a prominent place, but his brother is kind of like just a servant. And that word servant, by the way, is slave. It's doulos. And so he has sold out totally to Jesus Christ. To those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So one of the things we want to take a look at here is that, is that verse. And um, we want to break it down a little bit for you. So let's take a look at this. Um, the salutation is who? It's about Judah. Okay. Uh, Jude, rather, a servant of Christ Jesus, brother of the Lord, uh, brother of, the Lord, of, of James, sorry about that, to who? To those who are called, beloved of God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So there's three things that you're looking at there. They're called, they're beloved, and they're kept. And this is important as we're going to go through the, uh, through the chapter. And then he uses this Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied. Now, this type of salutation is something that is very, very uh, prevalent and, and uh, used in um, Paul and other writers of the New Testament. Then verse 3 gets really to the point of why he's writing. He says, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. Now, if you see that, what's really going on here is that there are a group of people that are already where? Does anybody have an idea? They've crept in the church. into the church, into the fellowship. And they've crept in unnoticed. Okay, And um, who long ago were designated for this condemnation ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and to deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there was a teaching that was going on during this time period called uh, Gnosticism. And Gnosticism had a couple things in here. I'm going to show you a little bit from William Barclay's uh, uh, commentary on this. It says, they denied, uh, denied our only Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. There is more than one way in which people can deny Christ, uh, Jesus Christ. A, they can deny him in times of persecution. B, they can not deny him for the sake of convenience. C, they can deny him by their lives and conduct. They can deny him by <laughs> developing false ideas about him. So you have persecution. You have convenience. Uh, you, can, you, you can be called a Christian, but not live a Christian life, your life and conduct. Uh, you can deny him by false teaching. And this is what was going on with the Gnostics. He says, these people are undoubtedly tinged with Gnosticism and its belief that since the grace of God was wide enough to cover any sin, 
In other words, the more you sin, the, the more, more grace, grace we can get you. They could sin as they like. The more they sin, the greater the grace. <laughs> Therefore, why worry about sin? Grace was being perverted into a justification for sin. In other words, there was no reason not to sin, because if you sin, God will forgive you. But they had one other th uh, problem. If these people were Gnostics, they would have two mistaken ideas about Jesus. First, since the body being matter was evil, they would hold that Jesus only seemed to have a body and was a kind of spirit ghost in the apparent shape of a man. So in other words, what's going on, the Gnostics did not believe that anything of matter was good. It was all evil, okay? Um, they would deny the real humanity of Jesus Christ. Second, they would deny his uniqueness. They believed that there were many stages between the evil matter of this world and the perfect spirit, which is God. And they believed that Jesus was the only one of many stages on the way. Now this is not as far whacked out as, as we think, uh, even if we think in modern terms, because these are some of the current things that are circulating around now. The more liberal theology gets into the fact of what we call adoptionism. In other words, he was just a man and then God picked him in order to put him on the cross. He really wasn't the son of God. That's one heresy. Another heresy is it's impossible for, for Jesus to be holy because he's matter, and because he is made out of matter, material stuff, he could not be holy. So these are things that are, are, are kind of like flying around. Now I want to <coughs> just show you um, what, what, uh, what, what is called the dogmas of the faith. And these nine things that are here are essential for the... Um, for, for Christian belief, if, if they're not present, then you're not into Christian belief. Creation from nothing. Along with creation from nothing, that man is made in God's image. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The universal sinfulness of mankind. The incarnation or virgin birth. The sinless life of Jesus. Why is the sinless life of Jesus important? Because if he had sin, he could not be the perfect sacrifice. If he was born of man, he could not be the perfect sacrifice. Miracles, supernatural actions of the Spirit, healings, all sorts of stuff like that. The blood atonement, and that's taken from the Old Testament, and you could see that in the series we did on uh, atonement and restoration. Resurrection, that Christ Jesus resurrected from the dead. What holiday do we celebrate about Jesus resurrecting from the dead, folks? Easter. Easter. And then again, his second coming. So these are the essentials of the faith, and, and they can be denied. And, and, and when you deny them, you begin to teach false teaching. So certain people have crept in. They're denying our only Master and Lord. In other words, Christ Jesus as being 100% God, 100% man, and being the only Lord of lords. Verse 5. I want to remind you, although that once you knew, that, it, knew it, Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now there's a passage from the book of Hebrews, if you want to turn to Hebrews 3, 15, 19. 15 through 19. And it's describing this very same thing. See, he's beginning at this point to uh, uh, start quoting things that are familiar to Jewish background, Christian background. So it's talking about the fact that they came out of Egypt. So what does Hebrew says? For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses, and with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Now here's the kicker of the, of the paragraph. So we see that they were not able to enter in because of, what's the word on there? Unbelief. And so he's using this as an example saying that these people are going to try to destroy your faith. 
They're going to try to destroy what you what you have, what you what you've been uh, holding on to. So they come in and they ask questions, and they're there to try to undermine the teaching of the church, trying to undermine your faith, trying to make you think that Christianity is something different than it really is, and and how it is displayed in the teaching and in the scripture. Okay, and so so as we move on, it says in angels, verse six. We're on uh, page 2450 in, in the, in the bond. We're on 2450 is where, is, where that, uh, is where the book is. So here we go. Okay. By the way, that, that page number is from the ESV Study Bible. So if you're not familiar with where to turn and everything, we're on page 2450. Heading towards page 2451. Okay. In juice. Just before, I got it. Okay. So... Verse 6, And the angels, who did not say, or stay rather, within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, just as uh, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So again, he's using another example. There's a, there's a teaching that, 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 you know, where, where Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. So here you have this, the, this, this rebellion of angels and everything going on. And as this rebellion is going on, they, they, they get chained and kept for the day of judgment, which is found in the book of Revelation. Revelation. Yeah. So Sodom and Gomorrah, what was some of the things that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Why did God toast Sodom and Gomorrah? What was one of the main things that were going on there? Besides being a wicked city, what was very prevalent? Yeah, run with it. One, you had inhospitality there. In hospitality, the strangers came in. Yeah, you know, look at the city, and then the men came in, and they wanted to be burned to them. Yeah, they had sexual immorality. Yeah, there were quite a few things going on. Yeah, so you had <laughs> inhospitality, you had sexual immorality, and it got to the point that God just said enough is enough, and burned it literally to the ground with the uh, hot hellfire and. Um, uh, actually, sulfur, mm -hmm. um, sulfur fire. So, I mean, excavators have gone there and have seen uh, proof that that actually happened. Yeah. All right, here we go. Verse eight. Are we are we really getting to the point now that we're we're going like, wow, this is some crazy stuff that's going on? So, they're meeting in a house church, and and somebody says, well, you know, I don't really believe blah 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 blah, trying to change the teaching within the group. Verse eight. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious one. Wow. Now, this is referring to false prophets. Okay? So, so somebody comes in and says, I have a revelation. And it's a, not a scriptural revelation. And, and they try teaching this extra biblical revelation. In other words, revelation that comes from outside of the Bible. And if you would turn with me, keep your finger there in um, Jude, and I'm going to give the scripture, but I'm also going to give the page reference as well for everybody. Um, and you want to turn to 2 Peter 1.16, which is on page 2419. Okay. Here's what you're going to read. Keep your finger there in Jude. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, what is the comparison between the dream thing and what they're talking about? For one, this revelation that they're talking about uh, back, in, uh, back in Jude was a situation of just somebody just having some type of something but here in Peter, what we're seeing is that this is an actual eyewitness account. Not a dream, not a made-up story. 
So we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And when we say we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, what does that mean? We were there. We saw this happening. Well, what did we see? Verse 17, For he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Now, they're on the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and this is where uh, 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 Peter, James, and John are there, and, and God, uh, well, the manifestation comes down that it's Elijah and, and Moses, and they're there, and they're talking, and after this is happening, Peter says what? Let's make a temple here. And Jesus is like, no, Pete, you don't get it. So it says that they heard a voice. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Verse 18, we ourselves heard this very born, voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. That's so kind of like, uh, when we when we talk about this, that you're in a situation where something happened and you're with one of your buddies, and then you you come to you come to fellowship and says, you know what happened the other day, and then you begin to explain what was going on, and 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 then your friend says, yeah, we were eyewitnesses, we saw that. So so this is not something that was made up. What it is, it's 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 a, a, a clarification and an attesting or an attestment to what is happening. Verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fur, uh, fully confirmed to which you do well to pay <clears throat> attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The day dawns and the morning star raises in your heart. And so what is going on with this is they're saying, pay attention to what we're trying to tell you. This is truth. Pay attention. We actually saw this. And then he says this in verse 20, which is very important. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Wow. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty powerful. Okay, And then he goes on and he says, look at this in, in chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there were... Uh, will be false teachers where? Among, among you. Who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bring, uh, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And what may follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their, in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah. And, and it goes on turning about this. What it's basically saying is, it's another affirmation from what Judas is trying to get across to you. So the idea of, of prophets and the idea of dreams if you turn to Deuteronomy 13, and you don't have to turn there, but I'll, I'll, I'll just refer to this. It says that if there's a prophet that comes and leads you astray, what are you supposed to do with that prophet? Stone him. Stone him. And when we're talking about stoning, we're not talking about what? Marijuana, right? Yeah. We're talking about what? What we're talking about is literally picking up stones and killing them. Because the false prophet is trying to lead you astray. The false prophet is trying to tell you things that um, that are basically false. Okay, but but the, but the the situation is that that people come in. Listen, folks, people come in to a fellowship with all sorts of things. All right, you ready for this one? The first thing they come in with is what? Baggage. 
it's like it's like going to the airport. Now I've I've traveled internationally, and and you see people from other countries, and they don't have just the one cart that you have. They have two or three carts. One time I remember seeing an Indian couple. The, the husband was pushing a cart, the wife was pushing the cart, and this little five-year-old is pushing a cart. They're, they're bringing baggage with them from where they've been. And so the first thing that you, you usually see is when somebody comes in, they're bringing baggage. The second thing that a lot of people bring in is motive. Why are you a part of us or want to become a part of us? Well, I want to, I want to be a worship leader. Okay, um, yeah, all right, well, well, we'll talk about that sometime. Well, the most important thing is that when they come, that when they arrive, that they catch the vision of the fellowship. All right? If you catch the vision of the fellowship, you're going to meld in. But if you do not catch the vision of the fellowship, then what are you going to bring with you? What was that? Strength. Strength? Strife. Strife. You've got to excuse me, I still haven't gotten my hearing aids back yet. Strife, okay? And strife brings what? Division. Division. Okay? And, that, and, and false teaching and stuff. So, here's, here's the point, alright? Brand new converts are usually the best to work with because they don't have to be deprogrammed. Everybody understand what I mean by that? And so you're, you're teaching and you're instructing and you're giving, uh, you're, you're giving uh, a, a opportunity for uh, people to be able to, um, well, just basically people to be able to, to grow in the faith. Now, as we're looking at what's going on with this and we start turning to verse 9, we see, but when the archangel Michael, okay, when the archangel Michael, uh, <clears throat> contended with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses. He did, not, uh, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now, you're going like, all right, I never heard that story. That's because it's part of the Apocrypha, the Old Testament Apocrypha. But these people were very familiar with this. How many of you know the story of Paul Bunyan? Yeah, or Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah. Now, are any of those true stories that are inspired that you want to put them in, in, in the Bible as uh, the book no. of Red Riding Hood? No. No, but they are popular stories that people can refer to, and a lot of those stories have a moral to them. Mm -hmm. And so Enoch, the book of Enoch, is a, a, a book that they were familiar with, and we're going to see this also later on in the book that he refers to it. But these are popular things that people knew and understood the plot line, and what it was all about. So the contending of the body of Moses is something that is Jewish folklore, but nevertheless they were uh, familiar with it. And the idea of this is that what he's saying is instead of trying to bring a counter judgment, just say, hey, I rebuke you. When the, when the devil gets to you, or tries to get to you, don't argue with him. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, just tell him where to go. Okay, rebuke him, tell him where to go. And, and this is what he's getting at here. But these people, look at this, verse 10, but these people, all they do not understand, and they, and, and they are destroyed by what they, <clears throat> what they like, unreasonable, and what they're like, unreasonable animals, understanding and sensitivity. Verse 11, woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam, Balaam's uh, era, and perish in Corinth's re, uh, rebellion. Now, does anybody know about these things? What is the way of Cain? What did first, Cain do? First murderer. Again. First murderer, right. All right. Um, what about Balaam? Who's Balaam? False prophet. A false prophet, right, who's seeking out gain. Remember, if you prophesy, we'll give you money. All right. What about Korah's rebellion? in the book of Numbers, and they rebel against, uh, against Moses, and, and, and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're really saying, you know, there's got to be somebody else, and then Moses basically said, look, so that you know the Lord is Lord, everybody who's not with this rebellion, could you get back behind me? 
I'm paraphrasing a little bit. So if God is God, let him do something that is totally unusual, like opening up the earth and swallowing him. The words weren't out of his mouth when the earth opened up and literally swallowed the entire rebellion. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw that, I would very quickly submit myself to the authority <laughs> of that fellowship. Okay? We haven't had anybody swallowed up by the earth yet. But anyway, so what does he compare these to? He says, these are hidden reefs. Now, if you do any sailing, one of the things that you really want to be able to understand is what's underneath the boat. Because if you don't know what's underneath the boat, and the boat hits like stone or rock or coral or whatever, particularly if you're in this one of a fiberglass boats, what do you think is going to happen to that boat? Yeah, it's going to rip the hull right out, just like the old Titanic got, got ripped. Okay, so these are hidden reefs, things that are hidden. And he says, hidden uh, at your love feasts. What's a love feast? Does anybody know what a New Testament love feast is? Communion? No, it's a what? Orgy. No, it's not an orgy. Okay, <laughs> we're talking about we're talking about church love feast. Okay, and 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 the situation is that the love feast, the love feast was was basically the gathering of the church, the house church. Those would be, what we do on Sunday would be technically called a love feast, but at the highlight of that was not the person who is preaching, but the Eucharist. Does anybody know what the word Eucharist means? Communion. What was that? Communion. Uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah, it's communion, but the actual term means the Thanksgiving. So the highlight of the gathering was that they celebrated communion in Thanksgiving, okay? So, so what, what's going on here? It says, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts, uh, 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 feast as they uh, feast with you without fear shepherding uh, shepherds them uh, without fear shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds sweeping along by winds uh, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead uprooted wild waves of the sea casting up bone uh, of their own shame wandering stars for whom gloom and utter darkness has been reserved in other words these are pretty bad dudes how many, how many of you have ever been in a situation where, where somebody really is, pardon the way I'm going to put this, but kissing up to you, trying to get your approval and everything, and then you find out what's really going on is they're out to get you. Yep. So they go along with what, you know, they go along with whatever's going on, and then the motivation for being with you is basically to get you. And, and when we do communion, one of the things that you need to understand is, what is it? It is a celebration of remembrance. Look at this passage uh, from uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 27 through 32. You don't have to turn to it. Uh, just, just take a look on the screen there. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, so, uh, and, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world." Now, the, the, the opportunity and the thing about this is, what is he saying? He says, there is something sacred about this. What you are celebrating is a remembrance of covenant. And what, what it is, is that in Middle Eastern terms, what takes place is every time there was a covenant and the people would gather together, they would have a celebration and remembrance of what that covenant is all about. And so when he says, this is my body and this is my blood, he is referring to the salvation that took place through his, his crucifixion and the hope of his resurrection. And so as we gather together, before we do this sacred remembrance, what, he is, what, what Paul is saying here is, Take a look at where you are at, and if you have any unconfessed sin, what are you supposed to do with it? Confess it. Get rid of that thing. So that you open into covenant with the Lord, pure, 
instead of denying who he is and what he is about and denying the covenant by your actions. And that brings judgment. And so what's happening with these people is they come into the fellowship, they participate in the love feast, they say that they're part and they want to be part of it, they say that they're, they're, they're so, solely sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ, where in reality they are there to try to sow discord. And, and don't think that that doesn't happen. Oh, yes. Okay? If you've been around the church, you know that there are people sometimes that get deceived and go, well, you know, I guess, I guess the best thing that I can tell you is my wife and I went out to dinner one day. And as we went out to dinner, there were people across the aisle. You remember the restaurant has tables, uh, yes. right? And you sit at tables and there are people that are around, you know? So, so there were people on the other side of us, and when they were on the other side of us, uh, they were having pastor for lunch. And, and I don't mean that the pastor was there. What I'm talking about is amongst themselves, they were denigrating the pastor. And that's sowing division and discord. And you don't want to do that. And you don't want to do that in the midst of also just taking communion and thinking everything is okay. All right, verse 14, page 2451. It was also about these, verse 14, that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. Now, when you look at this, who is Enoch from seventh? What, is, what it's referring to is the seventh generation uh, found in Genesis there. He prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all, to convict the ungodly of their deeds, the, ungod uh, the ungodless that they have committed in such ungodly way, and all of the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Now let's let's take a little more look at at, 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 at this, okay? Because there's there's characteristics here of the ungodly which will help you in identifying what is really going on here. In other words, these are people that, uh, that, that are sinful and that are going to be judged because they do not change their ways. They, they are grumblers. Uh, how, how many of you have kids? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when you're on a trip, what do you get? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How come the blah, blah, blah? I'm but, and, and, I'm what hungry. was that? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. All right. So they're, 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 they're grumbling. They're, they're complaining. You know, I got to go to the bathroom. But, but nothing ever seems to do what? Nothing ever seems to take care of their scenario or situation. Uh, malcontents. No matter what happens, they're always discontent. Regardless, they're always they're always like you know that didn't meet up to my standards or whatever. Um, following their own sinful desires. In other words, there's no filter. They do whatever the flesh dictates to them to do. Mm. You, you, you know what I'm talking about there? No filter. Okay. Um, they're loudmouth boasters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many people talk about themselves and nothing but themselves? about their accomplishments and what they're doing and look how great I am, you know, whoopee. Um, <laughs> they're showing favoritism to gain advantage. Hey, uh, so-and-so. Well, does anybody know a biblical character like that in the Old Testament? He was a son of David, had long wavy hair, would sit at the gate, and when somebody had a judgment from the king and it didn't go their way, would say, yeah, you know, if I was Absalom, king. Absalom. Yeah, Absalom. A spirit of Absalom in there. So, yeah, you see these people, and you see what's going on with them. And you take note. You know, Paul talks about in the book of Romans that those that are divisive, you take note of. And you take note why? You take note because of the poison that they're pushing out to the rest of the people needs to be approached. Uh -huh. and, and far too many fellowships and churches never discipline members who are doing this. 
And so what takes place is that from unity and, 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 and uh, solid relationship, division begins to come in and you begin to see the church do what? Split. And most church splits are not over doctrine, although there are a few that, that do, but most church splits happen over, believe it or not, relationships. You shake somebody's hand and they're like, oh, it's great to see you. We're inside of them what's really going on. Gee, I can't wait till they leave. Um, so, so you have this type of situation going on. Now, now look at 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers following their own un uh, ungodly uh, passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of spirit. Now, now he's just done nothing but tell you about all the bad stuff. Now he's going to give you an encouragement in 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Are you building your faith? Mm. You know, we're, 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 we're in a living room floor right now. Mm -hmm. Okay? And there's more weight here right now than there normally is during the week. Alright? But if it wasn't built properly, we'd be in the basement. And when you build up and when you encourage the idea is to nurture your faith like you nurture a garden. You want to pull out all the weeds. You want to uh, till the soil. You want to, you want to make sure that what you are building and what you're investing in is something that is solid from the Lord. So build up your faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. When you pray... Pray in the Holy Spirit. Now that, that could have two uh, aspects to it. It could be praying in tongues. But it also could be what? It also could be listening to the Spirit about what to pray for. Yeah, being led. <clears throat> okay? Is the Spirit guiding your, your, the direction of your prayer? When you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel a burden <laughs> to pray for somebody, that's called what? What type of prayer is that guy? Intercession. Yeah, intercession, right. But pray according to the movement of the Spirit and pay, pray in the power of the Spirit, keeping yourselves in the agape of God. In other words, a committed relationship. That's what agape is. It's a committed relationship that you love someone regardless of the circumstances or what's going on. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. If you confess, our, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to... Forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness so the burden falls off of you. It's confessed, it's done. You might suffer some of the circumstances or, or uh, what, what uh, consequences of it, but uh, that's what takes place. So you are looking constantly where? You are looking constantly to that day when Christ will appear. If you're looking constantly to the day that Christ will appear and the Holy Spirit begins to tell you about the sin in your life and uh, it's there, that, 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 that nudging of the Spirit to help you cleanse yourself of the sin. 22. And have mercy on those who doubt. Now, you know, here, there, there are... I don't think everybody just swallowed everything whole the first time around. Hello? You know? They doubt. And, and why, why are they doubting? They're doubting because doubt actually is a faith builder. As long as you're open to hear and weigh and reason what you're hearing. Well, I don't think that that sounds right. Well, here's the scripture that backs that up. So he's saying here, have mercy on those who doubt. In other words, minister them. Give them time. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Ooh. What is he talking about there? The unsaved. He realizes that their destiny is one of hell. So he's saying, snatch them out of that. To others, show mercy. How many of you have ever encountered an idiot? 
I mean, you know, you, 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 I mean, my perception about this is there are people that are so stupid or empty-headed that if, if they tripped and are falling on the sidewalk, you want to grab something because when the head hits, the vacuum will suck you in. The, 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 the scenario is to have mercy on people like that. All right? To have mercy on people. Um, it's better than getting mad at them. Hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And wh what is he talking about here? Show mercy with fear. Hating even the garment stained by flesh. You know, people that are non-believers don't understand what is going on. They see themselves as pure when in reality there's blood guiltness on there. And the sin that goes along with it, a lot of people are blind. They know something is wrong, but they don't know what it is or how to take care of it. So he's saying, show mercy there. Help them out. All right, let's turn the, turn the page here. And this is the end. Mm -hmm. Now watch what he says here. This is cool. Now to him who is able to keep you from what? Falling. Stumbling. <clears throat> and to do what? Present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. You. you know, this is, this is actually a pastoral verse. Because when you see this and you see people grow to the point that they understand the faith and, and operate in it enough, there's a joy to watch people grow. So he says here, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, only God, there is only one God, okay, in three persons. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our friend, our suggestion, no, our Lord. We have given him our life. We've given him everything. To be uh, our Lord, be the glory, majesty, dominion. Do you realize glory just kind of like oozes off of him? He is majestic because he's a king. He has a dominion and an authority over everything. Before all time and now, forever. And what does all God's people say? Amen. Amen. Now there's a couple things here that we need to actually look at as far as uh, application. Because all of this cool stuff that you just looked at, all of the history that's in here, all of the warnings that are in here, have an application. And that is this. Christian life is not stagnant. Yeah. Alright? Christian life is not stagnant. It does not say, hey, come to the altar, make a profession of faith, and everything is going to be okay. That's not what's going on here. It's not stagnant. It's constantly moving. It has a depth to it. And, and if you're not growing in your faith, if you're not putting something forth into it, then here's the thing. I've heard people say, I've been in the way, the faith, for 20 years. Well, no, you've been in the way, not growing. <laughs> Biblical ignorance to a Christian is no excuse. No. You need to, you need to uh, uh, sow into your Christian life. And that's part of what discipleship is. And when I watch you guys grow and change uh, over time and everything, I am like ecstatic. Okay? It's essential for the Christian to understand their faith. Why do you believe what you believe? Now, now we have a teens and twenties group that meets on Monday nights. And when a 12-year-old says something like this, what proof do I have to believe in what's being talked about? In other words, do I die and it's just over with? Or is this really true? Can you show me why it is true? That is a profound question. But it's essential for you to understand the hows and whys of the faith. A Bible study and understanding the theology of Scripture is vital. Now, that's a big word, theology, but everybody has a theology, including you, including an atheist. But how does your theology develop? What I mean by theology is the understanding of the function of how Scripture works from beginning through the end. Do you know the overall picture? Again, the reason why we advocate read the Bible from Genesis straight through to Revelation. 
It's not enough to know scripture. It must be what? Applied to one's life. It's not enough to know scripture. It must be applied to one's life. And I think that this is a very important situation to think about. Are you applying what you are learning, or is this just another thing like baseball and football statistics? If you apply what's in the Word, you will prosper. Yes, you will. But the situation is, if you don't apply what's in the Word, and you say you're a Christian, you will not prosper. You will probably be grumbling and moaning and complaining, saying, well, this doesn't work for me. I'll, you know, I used to do... Um, services on a Sunday afternoon in New York for an organization that was a drug rehabilitation place. And when you would give the altar call, everybody's hand would fly out. But the situation is how many of those people are actually applying? How are you applying it? Do you know the Lord? Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And if you don't and you hear or are watching this video this morning, today is the day that you need to reckon with that. But the scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the situation is that if you did not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or maybe you did commit your life to Christ but have not been active in, in uh, uh, letting that grow within you, or, or growing or being part of a group that is actually discipling, then, then you need to come to Christ. And it's very simple. It's so simple it's difficult for most people. But what you do is you acquire it through faith. In other words, we're going to pray a prayer, and it's going to, um, if you pray along with us and, and uh, commit your life to Christ this afternoon or morning, uh, what will take place, I hope that you will call us at the end of the message. There's a phone number to call us, and we will help you and disciple you into a deeper faith with Christ. So, do you know the Lord? Yes. Do you know the Lord? If you don't, and even maybe if you do, let's just pray together. If you want to rededicate your life to Christ this morning, just repeat after me either out loud or in your heart. Father God, I come to you this morning, and I realize my need for you. I realize my need to uh, become a Christian. And Father, I give you my life with all the garbage that's in it, with all the things that are going on. I'm making you boss of, and, and Lord over my life. I'm making you the center point of my life. I'm asking you this morning to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, and to give me new life in you. And Father God, we, we, we come to you this morning saying that we will, we will come to you and, and fellowship with you and read your word and, and Father, apply it to our lives. And Lord, we ask too that you would bring people, Father, that are praying this now for the first time or whatever, uh, into a situation of where they can be spiritually nurtured and fathered. So Father, we give you the honor, praise, and glory. We thank you for coming into our life as we give it to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So if you've prayed that prayer with us this morning, uh, take a look at the uh, phone number that we're going to show and give us a call. And, May God bless you and keep you. We'll see you next week.